Tonight we're joined by Lloyd Russell Moyle, Member of Parliament for Brighton Kemp Town. Um, and I don't think you'll mind me saying that he's uh, somewhat of a controversial figure in the Commons. Um, Lloyd has spoken passionately in the House of Commons regarding LGBTQI plus um, issues and young people's issues. And we're really lucky to have him here with us having a chat today. Thank you so much for joining us, Lloyd. No, it's a real, it's a real pleasure. Oh, the pleasure's all ours. Um, to start with, we might as well address the, the elephant in the room. Um, you've recently resigned from the Labour front bench um, regarding some comments you made regarding uh, JK Rowling. Um, do you want to tell us your thoughts on her and, and the turf movement in general? Well, I, 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 it was, there's been a, a number of weeks of kind of, uh, I, I made some comments that were, um, that were poorly phrased around JK Rowling and the rationale of why she was believing a certain thing. I still think what she believes on trans issues um, is uh, um, not right. Um, uh, but then what happened is that was the uh, kind of firing gun for um, the Daily Mail and others to start digging in, not just into me, but my staff members and others' lives and making it a bit of a misery. And, and we agreed, I had a good chat with Keir, and we agreed that I'd take a step back a bit, um, let things cool down, and then hopefully come back uh, uh, soon, uh, um, uh, soonish. Uh, on the actual issue, I think the problem with this issue at the moment is that there are lots of straw man arguments, arguments that aren't actually relevant to the issue. They are very interesting and relevant arguments, but they're not actually relevant to the issue in hand. And the issue in hand in terms of the very legal perspective, you can have good philosophical discussions about trans issues uh, more broadly. But the legal perspective is that at the moment, anyone that has a gender recognition certificate has all the legal protections as that gender, uh, as if they were born as that sex. That's the law. Um, but getting that gender recognition certificate is clumsy and not very good. Okay. Um, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work for most people. Um, uh, and because that's a medicalized approach, i.e. you have to have um, uh, gone through a psychiatric process, and it's not actually how you're living your life, and it doesn't necessarily give protections for anyone. You know, it doesn't necessarily give protections for women, it doesn't actually, uh, who, who say that they don't want um, uh, people uh, in their safe spaces for certain reasons, it, it doesn't give protection for trans people who say that they need access to certain spaces for certain reasons, et cetera, et cetera. You know, kind of, it just doesn't do its job. So the question is, how do we make a regional amendment? And what I was trying to reject was the idea that um, in this discussion, it is not a place to necessarily talk about everyone's fears around sexual assault, around rape, around... Those are important issues. But... Um, if we conflate those two issues, we're never going to get to any agreement that anyone's happy with. We're not going to get to an agreement that, um, that trans people are happy with, or um, uh, um, the minority of feminists, I believe, but some people who call themselves feminists, um, who are more sceptical about trans rights. You know, I think a lot of feminists actually are, are not sceptical about trans rights. They don't see it as, a, as, as an issue. In fact, they're, they're in favour of the reforms. So we need to try and get down to issues. That's what I tried to explain in the article. I tried to talk about how trans people have shown solidarity for JK, all of those kinds of things. But I phrased one particular paragraph that was very clumsy. Um, uh, and, and I was suggesting that she was using her sexual assault as bad faith. That was very stupid of me to do that. I've apologized, JK has accepted that apology. Um, we can still disagree uh, without kind of making each other feel bad. And that's how we need to reorientate this debate. Because this debate is a very important one for moving equality on in in our country. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the government's delay on um, revealing their plans for the GRA? And do you well, think I think that's concerned well, well, by the delay. Yeah, I, I think that's why we've got all this mess actually. Because if the government came forward with some actual proposals, then what we could say is, okay, well that has. Um, fulfills the needs of everyone, or there needs to be some tweaks there, well, there needs to be some safeguards there, and of course there needs to be safeguards. I mean, I'm not convinced that calling it self-ID, for example, is a particularly useful uh, piece of name, because it does sound like I'm just going to wake up every day and make my mind up what gender I am uh, and, and move on. Actually, that was never the proposal in the, in the report from the Women in Qualities uh, Committee, although they called it self-ID. What they wanted is a process in which you certificated based on your social 
acceptance rather than necessarily going through uh, um, a process uh, which was very costly and actually didn't take into account that social acceptance. Just like, you know, kind of when you get a new passport and you need to go to one or two people that have known you for a number of years to get a, 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 your, your um, photo signed off. Something similar to that may be. But yeah. because there are no proposals, I keep having to say maybe, because it may be that, it may not be that. Totally ridiculous. And if we'd had a proposal, I think we'd been able to have a decent conversation with all the stakeholders, and probably we would not be having this problem at the moment. And my view is that the analogy that I give is that they opened up this big black hole, and everyone threw all their fears of what would, could go wrong in it. And then you have these arguments on fears rather than arguments on practicalities. And that's a really difficult position to be in. And, and I think that, uh, so I think they need to take some of the blame. Um, and the way out of this is to come forward with some concrete proposals, not to try and shove it further down the line, because that would just allow this issue to simmer. Yeah. Do you think the um, the leak was to create fear in the meantime before they make any announcements? Possibly. It was. It was clearly to. Um, I, I think it was at least to kite uh, fly exercise, where you kind of um, you, you you see what the reaction is, and then if it's if you could push a bit further, you do. But that would be much me being a bit cynical maybe yeah <laughs> i think we're all on the same page <laughs> we're all on the same page there <laughs> um uh, so, so moving on from, from that i'm glad we talked about the jk issue um i think for any lgbtqi plus person um when a member of their community is elected into a position such as yours we get quite excited um so it, it's important that we have representation. Do you feel that it's important that we're represented in politics? Yes, I mean, I think it is. And, you know, I think, you know, kind of, we have a good representation at the moment. The chief whip of the Labour Party is, 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 is gay. Um, the uh, um, a number of the leading Labour Party people, the, the person who chairs the Standards Committee, Chris Bryant, of course, is gay. We've got Angela Regal, who is the vice chair of the LGBT Labour Group. So there's a lot of good people. Um, on both sides, actually, also on the conservative side. Um, uh, and for me, when I was growing up, some of those people, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, politics might have weathered me a bit, but I'm not that old. Um, uh, and when I was growing up, some of those people were people that I kind of looked up to in a kind of um, strange sort of way, not necessarily um, uh, because you kind of go, well, that could be me. You project yourself on that. And so I think it's important that you have those role models. They don't have to be role models in every single walk of life. You don't have to agree with them in every single area, but they're role models to say it can be done. And uh, um, I think that's important. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so in terms of you as a politician, I think you sort of drew an awful lot of attention from the community um, that that amazing time where you made that speech where you you came out as being HIV positive and I think it was such a passionate speech and we could tell from it how much that meant to you why, why was that so important well it was important politically as I mentioned because it was about making sure we didn't lose focus on some of the um, sexual health issues that the government was defunding it was important to do it because it would be the first to talk about it in the chamber um, but actually, on a very personal level, it's important because it's a weight off the shoulders. The real stigma that is, uh, happens a lot of the time is not just stigma of people attacking you, but it's this self-stigma, this self-fear. Um, and once you talk about things, you don't have the fear so much anymore. No one can attack you for it. No one can hurt you. You're not worried that the Daily Mail or some other hate newspaper is going to mm. do a horrible piece about you because you own your own history and background so there was a very personal level of doing that but I think that's important for lots of people to own who they are and then actually people can't attack you for it absolutely did you have threats then from press to, to out no, you no 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 I didn't but um the the only other um, MP that has ever come out although he didn't do it in the chamber and he resigned as an MP a few months later because there was a general election um was uh, was of course uh, Chris uh, Smith and uh, Chris Smith did have threats in the papers. They they threatened to uh, to leak it a year beforehand, and he asked them to be he asked them to keep it for a bit, um, and he would go to them. Uh, and then another paper started sniffing around, uh, an even nastier paper. And uh, then he felt like he had to come out and talk about it. So I knew that there had been, that had happened before, and there was always a possibility. And, and and I'm not good with that kind of thing hanging over my head. No, and, and nor would anybody. And I think. No. 
the attitudes around HIV have, have changed so dramatically. Yes. Um, and I think it, because it's, it's so well managed now and we've got so many at the point where it's undetectable, I think it's just the progress has been astonishing, really. And I think being open about it is the next phase in terms of keeping everybody safe, isn't it, as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, it is. It is because we know that treatment is the best way of cure at the moment. Yeah. You treat people and, and people don't get uh, infected. Mm. So that leads us perfectly onto a question about PrEP. So we're quite concerned. So there's been budgetary cuts um, and the rollout of PrEP has been delayed. How, how do you think that that is going to pan out? How, how are we going to, how's it well, going to It's now meant to be rolling out. Um, uh, but uh, but it, there has been lots of delays along on that process. PrEP isn't a panacea for everyone, but it does particularly help target certain communities um, that we know are at risk. Um, and in the end, it saves the NHS money. But the big problems that we've seen with NHS cuts is that they are always about short-term savings, and in the long term, they cost us more. So I, I am worried about it, but I am pleased that we've moved this forward. It's taken court action by people like Tenant Seekers Trust and AIDS Map and, and others. Um, because it, um, the government uh, was very slow in responding. And, and, the, and I must admit, the, the kinds of arguments that were given, and, and of course they are legitimate arguments to think about, but the kinds of arguments that were given sounded to me very much like some of the arguments that were given when the, the, the pill was introduced, um, uh, the contraceptive pill. You know, kind of, will it mean that people will end up having more sex? Will it mean that... Um, uh, that, uh, that, you know, kind of, um, that people will not just settle down in nice, stable relationships, all this kind of thing, which not, there was little evidence that that would have been the case anyway, but these are moral arguments, they're not uh, health arguments, and, and we must avoid having, mo my view is we must avoid having moral arguments in the NHS, you know, kind of, I am not in favour of drug taking, particularly, I, I've got no fascination with even smoking weed, let alone anything else, but I don't moralise if someone... Uh, you know, kind of has a has an experience that then requires NHS support. The same with smoking. You know, kind of. A, I don't smoke. I have no desire to smoke. But I don't moralise people who then get throat cancer. I feel dreadfully sorry for them. And I, if there is a way to cure it or to prevent it and allow them to smoke, I want to pursue that. You know, as soon as we start moralising, it's just such a slippery slope because it is a two-tier NHS. Then it will be a health service only for the fit and well, and not for the people that need it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. People just won't seek treatment. They won't even seek testing, will they? You know, yeah. that level of treatment is spot on. Anyway, a uh, slight change tack. Today at Pride in Surrey and Pride organisations across the country, we're celebrating Out and Proud Parents Day. Um, and uh, obviously looking at different family dynamics and I'm really interested in your views on the changes in schools and involving LGBTQ education in PSHG lessons and having representation in school libraries for example. How important is that do you think? I think it's really important. Uh, uh, interestingly we are just returning to where we had almost got to in the 1980s. I if I remember the things that caused section 28 was not because there was a great public um, uh, feeling uh, that, uh, um, that some of this was needed. The reason Section 28 was brought in was because educationists were introducing these very sensible measures um, and the government was afraid that local authority after local authority would want to introduce them. So they, they had to ban it by law, you know, kind of they were afraid that democratic uh, representatives and teachers would want to do this kind of education. Um, and so now the introduction of, of course, um, sexual relationship education in schools is a kind of 30 year delayed program that should have come mm. in when Eric and Ernie or whatever the, no, it wasn't Eric and Ernie, but whatever the book was, um, uh, that black and white um, picture book with the, the little girl and two dads um, uh, that caused all the furore in the, the GLA. So, so I think it's important and I think it's important because it gives role models for how different families can be and healthy families are not families that constantly are looking over their shoulder trying to think do we fit in healthy families know that families are diverse and what works for them is a good family and if it works it's good and if you're trying to fit into something else that doesn't work and then you're fretting over it and having arguments over it and trying not to be who you are it doesn't work that's the basis of a family um, uh, good families 
and and that's what we need to teach people in schools you know we want less hyacinth bouquets who worry about their social image and we want more people who are able um to be you know kind of modern families mm, absolutely. and it's so important for the kids isn't it you know the kids of same-sex parents or single parents mm. or who have grandparents who take care of them to see that representation um because you know i think for so long it's been the mum the dad and the 2.4 kids and the white picket fence and yeah. um life just isn't like that and you know for it's all never been it, it's just never been like that it's <sighs> a myth and we need to try and um uh, try and unpackage that and i think education is an important thing but not just education where you have it in a pse lesson where you have it in um in english classes and you talk you kind of experience uh, um uh, things like that in drama in, in those things where you're learning about different kinds of people not because they're different but because they've contributed interesting things to society you know kind of in in history you learn about Alan Turing maybe and in and in you know kind of in, in drama you can talk about you know kind of some of the amazing people who, in the theater in science you know kind of etc etc you you get the idea yeah it's just going to take a while to filter in isn't it i think yes yeah yeah, yeah. a few yeah. years yet slowly but surely um youth work you've got quite a strong background in youth work haven't you mm -hmm. yes yes yeah i care very much about a little bit. I, I originally i originally joined the youth service when i left school and started working for them when i was 16. um and then i worked at the national youth agency and represented us um in um uh in brussels as well as being a young person myself and taking part in uh, youth activities so i'm very passionate about it i'm passionate about it being a universal service um, which is supported by a targeted service, not a targeted service that is floundering around and doesn't have a universal base. Um, for many reasons, because I think if you just do targeted and don't do universal, what happens is you have um, a stigmatization of that service. You know, it's just for the people that have got problems, but also it's not a, um, it doesn't catch the right people, it catches them too late. The point of a universal service is you have it for all, people enter it, and then they can be identified when there are particular interventions that are needed, not when there's already problems with the criminal justice system, that's too late. Um, and so I'm passionate about it. We did a great report um, cross party on this and most of the parties adopted sections of it for their manifesto at the last election. So we've made some real strides here. But again, the issue is money, money, money. Always. And, and those puts that take, took place sort of, what was it, was it 10, 12 years ago now? Um, I, I've read that you, you have spoken about this quite frequently. I'm, I'm an ex-youth worker myself. I worked mm -hmm. for the youth service for many years. Um, and I just think that those cuts have had such a catastrophic effect on our communities. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel so sorry for young people that they don't have the opportunities that the, the people before them yeah. have. You know, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. There are some targeted youth projects and charities have worked very hard, I think, to try and fill the gap. But I don't think that we can replace the youth service as it was without without investment. And I think it's no. so important. We need to rebuild it. There is some acknowledgement of that cross party now. Um, but uh, these things do require investment. And I think there's a huge generational gap, actually. I think a lot of young people feel like they've been let down. I don't necessarily always true, but that is a feeling that is out there that, you know, kind of the older generation are able to afford their own home and able to, you know, kind of prosper and young people are left floundering. As I said, I don't think it's always true, but that is definitely a narrative that is, that is out there. And if we don't work to try and bring a more cohesive society, and that means investing in some of our young people, there's a real danger that divide will grow. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, moving on, uh, one thing we absolutely have to ask you about um, is the night in the Hazards of Common when the EU withdrawal bill was uh, delayed and in protest you got up and seized the mace. Yes. Uh, you did something that many of us watching at the time would have liked to do. Did, did you plan it? Was it done on impulse? I, I mean, I thought about it previously because I'm interested in that element of kind of, I'm interested in the element of protest and politics. I think the two go importantly together. Um, and of course, many people have done it. The first person to do it was Oliver Cromwell with the establishment of Parliament as it is. So that's what caused Parliament to be established as we know it today. And it's been done every 10 years, probably since then, um, or not since then, but in the modern history. Um, but on the day, I hadn't thought about it particularly. And I was just, I just happened to be, if I had been standing somewhere else, wouldn't have done it. I just happened to be standing right in front of it. I was pissed off, or, um, annoyed, uh, and I thought, 
I'm going to do it and just grabbed it. And as soon as I grabbed it, I thought, oh God, I haven't thought about what I'm going to do now. Do I put it down? Do I walk out? Do I do a little twirl with it? So you just kind of walk out and gave it to the, the security guard person. I mean, it's the same. John McDonnell, who's done it, and um, also Hesseltine, who's done it, they both say they did the same thing. They pick it up in rage and then they thought, oh God, what do I do with it now? So it's obviously a common kind of thought. The other thing that I thought is, oh God, I hope I don't break it. I'll have to pay for this. It's kind of uh, gold from like 300 years old. Um, <laughs> but it would be my house gone, wouldn't it? Or it would be, you know, kind of, that would be my, my salary docked for the next five years or something. Um, so that, 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 the reason you do it is because the idea is that the mace there symbolizes parliament's legitimacy to govern you lift it up to say parliament no longer has legitimacy to govern and in this case it didn't because it was being denied a vote it was being denied a voice and a say in the future that was are you glad you did it um i wish i'd done it slightly different it was only like two weeks after i'd done the hiv announcement and i kind of wish that i don't I had a bit longer in between each hit. <laughs> well, I have to say, we were so glad to do At that time, like a lot of people, particularly Remainers, um, we were glued to Parliament yeah. TV and uh, we've been watching every second and we were as infuriated, I think, as you probably were. And when you did that, we were practically cheering, weren't we? Oh, we yeah, were yeah, a little bit shocked and it was a fantastic moment. I don't think I'll ever forget that. No, I'm sure you won't. <laughs> no, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> Where are we now? <laughs> um, so, yeah, we do need to ask you, do you say that the pride, uh, the pride movement is still important in today's climate? Yeah, well, look, I think pride is very important and it's important for the two reasons that it's always been important. It's about celebration and it's about protest. And those who say it's just a celebration, I think, lose a bit of their way. But those who say it's just a protest as well, lose a bit of their way because it's that mixture. It's about saying, um, I am what I am. Here I am. Take it or leave it, you know, kind of. But I'm not going to hide anymore. Um, I'm going to forge a new world that is in my image, not in the image of others. Um, and uh, the other part of it, of course, is saying there are still many things that we need to change, laws that we need to do, we're not going to cope with repression anymore. And that is political as well as personal. And that's, uh, that's important, I think. Um, and that's why, um, uh, um, uh, and that's why, of course, we uh, do um, need to keep doing it. It's, it's almost a shame that we still have relevance today, isn't it? Because we should have these rights. We shouldn't need to protest for basic human rights anymore. No, you're right. We shouldn't. Um, but uh, again, I don't think we should think of it just as a protest. Even if the rights are achieved, we should continue to celebrate diversity. Yeah, it's nice to have a part. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I think we're probably done. Aren't we? so really, we need to move on to probably the trickiest question you've ever been asked in an interview. And um, we need to ask you to pick a song for us to play you on the radio. Well, I think because it's Pride and because Pride's partly about saying, I am what I am, um, I think we should go with that song. Um, uh, and uh, there's a number of versions of it the Gloria Gaynor um, one, um, Shirley Bassey. Uh, one, they're, they're all great. You, you, you take your pick, but of course, originally it is from uh, Le Cage, uh, which was a French and American comedy on the theatre and made into two different movies. And what's that about? It is about a conservative family coming and meeting a very gay family, um, two men who raise um, a, a son, um, but also realizing that families are complex and they have difficulties in themselves. And that song is about the, the kind of um, the non-biological father, because of course in the comedy you have the biological mother, the biological father, and then you have the non-biological father who is with the, the biological father, feeling throughout the whole play that he is second fiddle, he's not good enough. And this is about saying, bugger it, I'm going to be who I am. And I'm gonna show these conservatives that we are valuable and we are important here so i think it has a nice political message as well be as well as being just a great gay anthem you can belt out <laughs> fantastic well done nice choice nice choice <laughs> um so thank you so much um for speaking no, to us today we've really enjoyed it so My yeah thank you Speak to you soon yeah
Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Cheers. It's going to be Pride on the Road and an online show. It really is. It's going to be a fantastic, phenomenal online show because we've got Chanel number five, as you can see here on the screen, performing for us. We've also got incredible performances from more top talent, including chart topping and absolutely sensational Bang Bang Romeo. They'll be performing their new hit single and a couple that you'll be familiar with. I really, truly cannot believe they're joining us, but they will be joining us for Pride on the Road, alongside many other top talents, including Danny Beard, Angie Brown, Rowetta from Happy Mondays, it's just going to be absolutely incredible. There's loads more top talent and loads of local talent to uh, get involved. Be sure to join us over at prideinsurrey.org forward slash on the road Saturday and Sunday, the 8th and 9th of August. And remember, if you see us out and about, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter, use the hashtag pride on the road. So once again, to find out more information on Pride on the Road and to get involved, head over to prideinsurrey.org forward slash on the road. Be who you are, be proud and remember to use hashtag Pride on the Road.